Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Perks. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman in her forties with gingery hair, a big smile, and I'm wearing a blue and white stripy shirt. I'm a curator, journal and podcast editor for Engage, and professor of curating at the School of Arts and Creative Industries at Teesside University in Middlesbrough, which contains MIMA, our fantastic art gallery and museum, which I'm sure most of you know. I'd like to welcome you all to this really special launch event um, for our journal number 46 our engaged journal number 46, which is on the topic Generation Z and the future of creative work. There's lots of amazing contributions from the UK and Ireland to this journal, and I'd really like to encourage you to read these. And there's three ways that you can do it. One, you can buy a journal online as a, a PDF for £10. Uh, you can get a subscription, which means you can read everything, but unless you're a library, I'd say that the Engage membership is the perfect way forward, and it starts from £3.25 a month. So housekeeping for this discussion and event is really simple. We're just asking you to use the Q&A function. Um, so you can relax as I won't be asking you to use your cameras or microphones. Um, and I'm um, also helped by the fabulous Lily uh, Mason, our Business Development and Marketing Officer at Engage this evening. And this event will finish at 8 p.m. If you're watching this later, the phone lines are already closed, as they say. So I can spend an hour telling you all about the journal, but I want to highlight five key points, and then you can explore it fully later. So this edition concentrates on um, the UK and Ireland, as I mentioned before. It's got essays, conversations, checklists, and manifestos that explore and expand the future and um, structure of our profession. This journal debates the changing needs, creative pathways, opportunities with and for young people today, collectively known as Generation Z. And we've got three framing sections of the journal, analysis, action, and empathy. As I mentioned in the editorial of the journal, we've made a decision to focus on Generation Z, um, which we understand could be limiting in some way, as of course we want to acknowledge a range of ages as early career or entrance into a workforce. Mm -hmm. And also we're potentially lumping together um, a 15 year old um, age range easily uh, into consumable stereotypes. And this isn't the intention. It's really important that you know, we acknowledge the limitations of using this lens and that we, you know, defend our consideration of Generation Z on its own. So by narrowing this canon, we really hope to capture the concerns of this moment in which young people have been subjected to tremendous uncertainty and instability in their developing years and recognize young people as a priority for our programs, our projects, our sector, for the funders and stakeholders who govern the cultural landscape. So Gen Z is now widely used to reference those born after 1997 and up to 2012. So broadly speaking, those who are 10 to 25, following on from Generation X and the millennials. Coming of age with a distinct set of contemporary um, social and political economic factors, we've got the global pandemic, populist politics, and of course the climate crisis. Also, this journal is going to have an accompanying podcast series in autumn, so that's something to look forward to. And I just want to do a big thank you up front to all amazing contributors, of which there are many, so please do check out the full list on our website. Now, I've started a little tradition last year that I want us to continue for our journal launch events. And it's to ask the really amazing Skinder Hundle MBE to record a short provocation for us. So Skinder is Director of Arts at the British Council. Um, he's been in this role for over a year now. And prior to that, he was CEO and Director of the New Art Exchange in Nottingham. So I'm going to ask Lily to play the video. Now, Skinder at the moment is on a formal um, trip to, um, is in France at the moment. He'll tell you about it. Does it like he's on holiday, but I guarantee he is not. Over to Lily. Hello, everyone. And um, sorry for my last minute video. 
I am here in Arles and you can see behind me a magnificent architectural design. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think when we think about Generation Z, we think about the future of working in the creative industry, then we have to be clear about something. And that is this decade, for example, for me, is about finding a genuine truth um, challenging some of the kind of um, structures in which we are working and operating and that we've got to find new spaces that are ascending um, us into these kind of third spaces of inventive kind of formula or inventive design that's collaborative, international, brilliantly local and dealing with some of the key challenges of our time, you know, challenges of climate, of equality, diversity, but also about how new economy is going to work and how technology and artificial intelligence is going to sit within our kind of spectrum of knowledge. I think also the intergenerational wisdom between um, those people who have played an active role um, in creativity, in leadership roles, working with um, this new generation that is not shy of sharing how they feel about the world they're in today. So providing that space of courage um, that enables um, younger people, younger sort of communities to participate in um, making decisions, informing policy, but practically making things happen on the ground as much as in the kind of outer space of visionary thinking. Um, and providing that kind of experimental space for that investment is so, so critical right now. Um, because without it, we will be stuck and we're one fifth into a century that I feel um, is not being led very well. And the new generations may be seeing things at a pace that um, could be quite exciting, given the resource, given the space to be enabled. And, you know, in the background, you probably can't see it, but there is a performance happening right now of new generation, younger co cohorts, co you know, younger artists who are, you know, in a sense, taking control of the environment we're in um, and playing an active role in that kind of collaborative spirit. So the collaborative spirit, um, looking at science, looking at technology, looking at art culture, looking at civic responsibility and looking at um, the world in a, in, a, in, a, in a total system kind of perspective. Um, I think that's a, an exciting space to be in right now, but we need to have um, an ecology that then enables that. So it's creating the enabled space for innovation to happen. So I think that for me is worth pondering on. Um, how do we create that enabling space for invention to take place, for experimental um, excitement to be shared, and for narratives that are new, that take us out of um, this kind of rut that we are potentially facing uh, in the world today? Ask yourselves, what does the world need right now? So... Thank you so much, Skinder. Thank you for sending that provocation to us and lots to think about in that short talk. Now, we have a very special keynote coming to you um, from Canada. Um, Dr. Miranda Campbell is an Associate Professor in School of Creative Industries at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, and her research focuses on creative employment, youth culture, small scale and emerging forms of creative practice. So I'm really excited to have followed this lead from one of the young people who contributed to the journal, who actually quoted uh, Miranda within her piece. Um, and um, Miranda's written lots of uh, publications and books on this, including this year, a book called Reimagining the Creative Industries, Youth Creative Work, Communities of Care. And also another one this year called How to Care More, Seven Skills for Personal and Social Change. So welcome, Miranda. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'll just hand straight over to you if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you very much for, for having me here. I'm very excited to, to be with you as you launch this amazing edition of the Engage Journal. So I'm Miranda Campbell. I'm a middle-aged white woman with long brown, brown hair and glasses. 
Today I'm wearing a navy blue dress with a floral print. I'm going to share my screen now and start my short talk. So as Sarah mentioned, I'm a professor of creative industries in Toronto, Canada. Much of my research examines youth and their process of entering and finding work in the creative industries, the accompanying challenges, and also the emerging alternatives. Today, I'll be sharing with you some of, some of my framework for make, making sense of these emerging alternatives from my book, Reimagining the Creative Industries, and my framework for defining care from my book, How to Care More. The challenges of making a living in the creative industries are increasingly well known. Working conditions include precarity, low and no pay, necessity of networks and of networking, instability and insecurity, and so on. Toxic work environments can include sexual misconduct and racism and continuing inequalities along the lines of race, gender, class, sexuality, ability, and age. And yet young people still increasingly want to enter into the creative industries and also develop new ways of working and collaborating based in collective care. As one of my research participants stated, we are in this together. We need to come together. In my research, what I term communities of care demonstrate a shift towards a collective impulse and suggest the resilience of alternative formations of social enterprise within the broader neoliberal uptake of the creative industries as an economic driver. The neoliberal imperatives of the creative industries instrumentalize risk as an individual concern and suggest the need to compete for seemingly scarce resources. Communities of care foreground, foreground a collective rather than an individual response to mitigating and managing this risk and create broader support structures in the absence of policy frameworks. Through communities of care, youth creative workers are charting their own pathways for what creative industries employment looks like. Today, I want to share with you some char characteristics of care for the creative industries, why it's needed and what it can look like, and share some examples of youth collectives and initiatives that carve out a more caring pathway for creative work. These examples are largely based in Canada where I do my research, but I see a wealth of examples in this edition of Engage and I think these kinds of youth initiatives can be found in many places. What we need is a vocabulary to identify the, the importance of these initiatives, even if they can sometimes be small scale, emerging or fleeting. Today, I hope to offer some of this vocabulary and a way of making sense of problems and solutions in the creative industries. If the creative industries are broken, how can we fix them? What I term care thinking for the creative industries is made up of three components, relationality, recognizing structural barriers, and committing to new visions. Care thinking is a more caring approach to creative work given the known challenges and inequalities. First, care thinking involves a relational ontology or theory of self. Care has been devalued, but all people give and receive care even if their caring labor is delegated or forced onto others. Creative industries work can involve cutthroat competition and an individualized self. But how does this picture shift if we think of our relations, bonds, and connections with each other? Next, care thinking also involves an investigation of structural barriers and inequalities related to giving and receiving care. We are all in this together, was a phrase that was popularly heard through the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. That might sound relational or collective with the emphasis on we and togetherness, but COVID also exposed deep social inequalities and differences in capacity to navigate the pandemic. Care thinking recognizes the historical, political, economic, and social factors that impact our lived experiences and how we relate to one another. Investigating structural barriers means reflecting on differing capacities and inequality with how we care for ourselves and others, rather than assume collective capacity exists or that experiences are collective. Third, care thinking can involve utopian or transformative speculation, a commitment to recognizing barriers and developing alternatives. Given that inequalities exist, what strategies for inclusion are needed? 
what new visions for the creative industries can be developed. Committing to developing new visions is an expression of care. My research investigates what new visions for the creative industries are being developed by young people entering the creative industries and how creative industries are being redefined from the perspective of care. Today, I'll share three characteristics of how the creative, how, of how the creative industries look when redefined by care thinking, relational autonomy, widening access, and balancing economic and community needs. Many youth and small scale cultural producers demonstrate a well-informed awareness of the challenges of creative industries work. The, the draw of this form of employment for many youth is not that it is lucrative. Creative work can allow for a sense of autonomy and self-realization, which is even more appealing given the challenges of the labor market at large. I foreground relational autonomy to recast the definition of autonomy in more communally based ways. With contemporary youth creative work, there is a desire for creative work to be autonomous, but not separate from the social realm. With an awareness that neoliberal norms of economic competition are harmful and exclusionary, many young people strive to reimagine creative work differently and collectively. This can mean foregrounding collaboration instead of competition. We can see this idea of relational autonomy with T-Base, a Toronto-based collective that centers artistic expression from the Asian diaspora. T-Base was a community arts space housed in the Chinatown Centre shopping mall in downtown Toronto. T-Base offered a space for artists and activists to, to develop and showcase projects, or just come and hang out. Many of T-Base's activity, activities happen through working relationally with friends, family, local community members, cultural heritage, and an embeddedness within the Chinatown neighbourhood. Some of T-Base's emphasis is on Chinese language and culture, their most popular event was Mahjong Mondays, a weekly gathering to play the traditional Chinese tile-based game. T-Base also holds mother tongue language cafes in Cantonese, Mandarin, and Vietnamese to practice language skills. Co-founder Hania Cheng also speaks to family connection in T-Base programming, highlighting soup making and macrame work workshops with her mom as some of the favorite events she has done. For many youth, for many youth creative workers, the desire for relational autonomy is expressed as a desire to carve out space for the self and others away from dominant models that do not see or support them. Artists Humboldt Magnussen and Marianne Versteppen met while doing their master's degrees in fine arts, but even with their master's degrees in hand, they reflected on the, the lack of opportunities and difficulties for emerging and young artists to make a living from their work. With this in mind, they started the Younger Than Beyonce or YTV Gallery in 2015 in order to provide a space to showcase emerging, emerging artistic work. In 2015, the Younger Than Beyonce would have been for artists 35 years old or younger, based on Beyonce's age at that time. But the gallery is focused on supporting emerging artists rather than operating with any strict age-based cutoff. Co-founder Humboldt Magnuson states, this is about making our own opportunities for ourselves as a young group of people. It's really important to foster that. YTV develops group base rather than individual opportunities. Humboldt says, it's really important to work in a team. I think the reward is so much greater. It's like sports. When you're on a team and you accomplish something, you get to high five your teammates. But if you're by yourself and you win the medal, you only get to high five yourself. Expressed in this way, only high-fiving yourself suggests the loneliness and isolation of neoliberal models. With care ethics and communities of care, autonomy is not forwarded in these isolated ways. In this context, communities of care carve out autonomy from the more dominant systems of individualism and competition, making space instead for friendship and collaboration and other relational values. Following from youth's informed awareness about labor challenges in the creative industries, there's also an informed awareness about structural barriers and a lack of diversity. To this end, I forward access as an emerging characteristic of how youth creative workers define their creative industries pursuits. Widening access to, to creative work in terms of diversity and equity has been expressed by my research participants as something they care about. 
Widening access suggests a relational model of self and an expansion of who works in these industries alongside moving towards more inclusive working practices. We can see this idea of widening access with Peers Program. Peers Program was a, a paid three month a paid three month peer mentorship program that ran from 2015 to 2017. It was organized by Whooper Snapper Gallery in Toronto and incubated groups of emerging artists, curators, arts organizers, arts organizers, and other cultural producers. Commenting on Peers organizational structure, former director of programming Josh Vitavelli says. It sounds very simple, but the way it was done became very important. Many of the artists involved have continued on with impactful professional careers, but Josh cites ongoing friendships with all of the peers participants as a lasting impact of this program. This, the program was structured with reflexivity on applicants and various structural factors that impact how participants do or do not gain access to art world institutions and supports. Importantly, peers offered participants an honorarium payment for participation, mindful that time away from paid work to participate in programs is a privilege not available to many emerging artists. Josh reflects on race and representation in arts institutions and comments on an administrative strategy of setting what they call a maximum capacity for historically overrepresented artists instead of the inverse where many institutions often work to meet a minimum requirement of diversity. Commenting on the language of historical overrepresentation, Josh also says this strategy addresses what's really happening, which is the pervasiveness of white supremacy, rather than a lack of artistic talent or merit from, from historically underrepresented artists. The Dandelion Initiative is another project that widens access and opportunity in the creative industries by working to, to develop more inclusive and safer working conditions for all. The Dandelion Initiative, or the DI, is a not-for-profit organization de dedicated to gender-based and sexual violence prevention and survivor supports. The Dandelion Initiative was started after several high-profile sexual assault and sexual misconduct cases in the creative industries and nightlife industries in Toronto. The DI's first training program, Safer Bars and Spaces, was directed to sexual violence prevention in the nightlife industry. Another DI program called Safer Artistic Spaces addresses art spaces and sectors including live music, live performance, venues and film, and addresses workers like, and addresses workers like performers, artists, and contract workers. These types of spaces are often not formal workplaces and as such may not be governed by formal employment standards. And this program addresses violence and safety in this context. When a company books the, the DI Safer Bars and Spaces training, the organization mandates that owners and managers attend trainings alongside staff, working towards stabilizing what DI founder Victoria Bell calls unequal dynamics between back of house and front of house. Front of house staff are largely comprised of women and are more likely to witness sexual violence take place and face a greater possibility of experiencing, experience, experiencing that directly in their workplace environments. Back of house or managerial staff are positions dominated by men and often hold decision-making power. Having both of these groups participate in training aims to open a pedagogical space with both groups involved in repairing a culture. Committing to care and changing a toxic culture doesn't mean forgetting about economic concerns. People still want and need to make a living, including being fairly compensated for their work. In practice, this means navigating the tensions between community and economic values. Strategies to find balance between community and economic needs remains challenging within an overarching capitalistic framework. One balancing strategy between economic and community-oriented values voiced by my research participants is limiting performing unpaid work for larger or established organizations. Just say no was a common response to the question of how respondents navigate the expectation that they work for free or give away their creative work for free. Other respondents commented that working for free was a more common part of their experience when they were younger and they have learned the skill of saying no. At the same time, my research participants also voiced the strategy of taking on free and community oriented labor through the lens of fostering diversity and inclusion and also through the lens of friendship and peer support. 
We can also note the contemporary rise of cooperatives and unions to safeguard worker rights and develop shared ownership. These kinds of initiatives have a long history, but we're also seeing a renewed interest and resurgence in these kinds of cooperative initiatives and values. Founded in 1972 in London, England by Jonathan Harvey and David Panton, Acme Studios is a housing charity dedicated to affordable and secure studio and live workspaces for artists. Currently, Acme is the largest single provider for affordable artist studios in England, renting space to over 800 individual, individual artists in 16 buildings in the greater London area. Seven of these buildings are owned by Acme and the others are held mostly on long-term leases. Beyond securing arts funding to build their own spaces, Acme advocates for a partnership model of cultural planning gain between commercial developers, local government, and artists for the construction of new buildings. So cultural planning gain, artist studios are allocated space in new developments, and developers are permitted by local authorities to break ground. Co-founder David Panton developed an advocacy model of the dynamic triangle for Acme, highlighting the confluence of society, business and culture based in, a, in triple wins or benefits for all parties. For local government, the gain is a fully occupied building with long-term mixed tenants, creating a resource base for local employment. Developers gain by being permitted to break ground and artists gain affordable long-term studio or live work spaces built to suit artists' specifications in the deals brokered by Acme. There's often much discussion of artists leading gentrification or catalyzing change and displacement in low income neighborhoods. How can artists instead be anchored in neighborhoods and how can community, economic and cultural goal goals be brought together? To wrap up, I wanna consider what this all means for how young people equip themselves to face creative work. Making a living in the creative industries requires entrepreneurial knowledge, hustle, and grit. But the challenges of diversity and inclusion in, in the creative industries also are also uh, well known and are in need of remedies, so a different kind of skill set is also needed. I offer care as an umbrella concept to think about 21st century creative industry skills. Sometimes we think about care as a set of personal values like being kind or civil to others. Traditionally, if we think about someone being caring, we think about them being nice or pleasant. Our interpersonal values and how we conduct ourselves are important, but this definition of care falls short of encompassing the types of new visions and commitment to change I've been discussing today. In a famous definition of care, Bernice Fisher and Joan Toronto outline that care is a process made up of many steps, including paying attention, taking responsibility for a problem, being competent to do the hands-on work, and being responsive to those who are being cared for. This definition of care encompasses the layers and steps of care, but doesn't, but doesn't fully register all the different types of skills and action that care might entail. In the center of this diagram, you see my definition of, of care as relational action, action we take in relation to others to work towards new visions. As an active process, care can require building skills in listening, consent, collaboration, cultivating inclusion, love, and resilience. What could the creative industries look like if workers had well-developed skills in those areas? The projects I talked about today, T-Base, Younger Than Beyonce, Pierce Program, Dandelion Initiative, and Acme Studios give us some insight into what the creative industries could look like if we center care as an active and relational process. Is the vision and view of the creative industries we see emerging from many youth creative projects, and it's the vision and view of the creative industries I want to inhabit as a researcher, teacher, community member, and fan. I trust this is the vision and view of the creative industries you are striving for as well. And with collective care, we can make it possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. That was a really um, succinct and amazing um, and lots to think about in terms of the research you've been doing and really this idea of care that is really kind of, I think, crucial. And we can discuss that as a panel. But I just wanted to know from your experiences as a researcher on the, you know, on the ground, if you like listening, um, what's the kind of, you know, 
biggest sort of um, you know issue that you feel we're facing, a sort of contradiction that maybe comes up again and again within your research? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think um, some of those contradictions are felt most acutely in, in that last area of, uh, of care that I touched on, the kind of balance between community and economic needs. Because the challenges of making a living are real and pervasive, you know, uh, of course, we have rising costs of living, uh, fewer opportunities, um, more difficulty of making uh, ends meet. But at the same time, um, from my research with young people, uh, we can really feel a, a desire to do something different. It's almost like, what's the point anymore? Um, you know, one uh, young person shared with me a story uh, you know, showing up for an interview for an unpaid internship and realizing they were competing against hundreds of other applicants. Like, why are we all competing against each other for nothing, for this kind of scarcity, something for ourselves, more collaborative, more community oriented, more inclusive, uh, widening access, you know, um, you know, investigating, repairing structural barriers. That said, you know, we still live in a capitalistic framework. We need to keep the lights on, right? So how can we do those community projects and make them sustainable, make them inclusive, um, but also pay ourselves a decent living wage and pay, uh, pay others? I think many of the projects um, that I talked about today uh, are finding different ways to try to make that happen, but it's often really challenging. Um, in my research, I still wanna kind of shine a light on those projects, even if some of them may have already stopped existing because of those challenges, we can still learn a great deal about care, about how to do di differently and how to center um, people in the process of working collaboratively. Okay, thank you, Miranda, that's super. I'd like to invite the rest of the panel to turn on their cameras now and to join us to have a discussion about this subject and about these, um, you know, the provocation from Skinner and also the great keynote from Miranda there. Um, so I'm gonna invite everybody to introduce themselves um, and also to tell us, you know, uh, why they're interested in this topic, why they're interested in Gen Z and the future. So we've got joining us Amani Mitha from Liverpool Biennial, um, Tara Page from Offset Projects and Lee Hornsby from Creative UK. So I want to start off with Amani um, and also some of you may recognize her from last year from our journal launch. And the reason I wanted to invite you back is as a sort of, you know, member, if you like, not saying that you represent the whole of Generation Z, but a member of Gen Z, who since we last spoke in this forum has got a job, which is amazing as associate curator at Liverpool Biennial. So Amani, if you don't mind introducing yourself and uh, telling us a bit about that, please. Hello, so I'm Amani, Assistant Curator for the Liverpool Biennial. I go by she, her. I have long brown hair with blondish highlights and brown skin. As Sarah pointed out, I am in my mid-20s, I'm 25, just about make the cut of Generation Z. Um, I recently just finished my Master's at the Royal College of Art in Curating Contemporary Art, and since then have been appointed as Assistant Curator at the Liverpool Biennial. My practice or my interest intersects both politics, the contemporary and specifically cultural policy and how that affects diversity and adversity. And that's kind of what I'm looking at in the biennial. Um, I think obviously I'm interested in Generation Z because I'm a part of it, but also for the creative industry, I think it's so hard for us to find our feet and to find something that not only we can endorse, but also be a part of. Um, and I think I'm just finding or starting to find my feet with that. So it's nice to be able to share that journey as well. Super, thank you. And over to Lee, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Hornsby. I'm a white man. He, um, I have, I still swoop my blonde hair back, which I think is pretty uncool these days, but I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with that. And I'm wearing a blue polo uh, t-shirt today. Um, so I'm Lead Development and Partnerships Manager at Creative UK. Um, we champion, connect, support, and invest in creative people and businesses all across the creative, creative and cultural industries um, in the country. Um, and I have a particular focus on our education networks. And um, so thinking about the whole picture, 
to do with creative skills, education and qualification and everything that touches on that, um, including policy. Um, and our angle on that really is to really try and champion and advocate for the creative talent pipeline. So thinking about the future of the creative and cultural industries and the people entering into it in the future. Um, and obviously that's where the interest comes, um, where it comes to Gen Z and thinking about those pathways into to our sector and pulling apart the barriers that there might be there across various different avenues, some of which um, Miranda's touched on today and very much applicable to, to what we see in the UK, but other things as well, barriers around policy, um, barriers around access and um, barriers around place. Um, so yeah, trying to get to the bottom of all of those with our members, with our networks that we that we work with and with government as well. Okay, thank you. And over to you, Tara, please. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tara Page. Um, I am a black woman. I'm in my uh, mid thirties. Um, I am of Caribbean heritage and my skin color um, is, uh, I might describe it as kind of caramel toned. Um, I've got show, oh, just past shoulder length um, brown curly hair. Um, I'm wearing glasses today and I'm also in a short sleeved uh, wide stripy shirt that is uh, kind of navy and white. Um, so a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I am a co-founder and co-director of Offset Projects. Um, Offset Projects was founded um, and launched at the end of 2020. Um, and so our work is very much around working directly with and for young people um, up to the age of 25 um, to support projects around youth voice, um, to support projects that enable um, youth leadership and also person-centered learning. And so right at the heart of Offset Projects is it's very much around what children and young people are interested in right here, right now, where their, you know, where their energy and where their ideas are at right now. So kind of moving away from a common approach that tends to ask what young people want to do in the future and, you know, when they grow up, quote unquote, but we're really interested in, you know, what, what they're doing right now, what they're interested in right now, and, and how that can be used um, as, a, as a starting point for carving out career pathways, um, which is all why this, you know, this conversation is super interesting. Thank you. And I just want to stay with you, Tara, for the moment, because I wanted to ask about space and place. And just wanted to ask you how important um, you feel it is to this conversation as regards to where you are. I mean, we're pretty well spread out, actually, um, obviously across the across England, UK and beyond. But tell me, like, what it you know, what what's so important about the place that you're in and the space or, you know, is it not important? Um, I think, yeah, that's a good question. So we are, so Offset Projects in works across the country, but we are based in Milton Keynes um, and work really closely with the young communities of Milton Keynes. Um, and Milton Keynes is a really unique um, city. I can say that now because it was recently granted city status. Um, a really unique city um, that's uh, still quite young, um, just, uh, just over 50 years old now. Um, and so because of that, the challenges that young people face um, in terms of accessing a relatively uh, also youthful um, creative economy, um, you know, those, those, those challenges are also quite unique. So, um, you know, they're unique, but at the same time, you know, not too dissimilar, I should imagine, from, from many of the other big cities. Um, and unique sometimes, I think, in quite a negative way, but also potentially in quite a positive way. So whereas, you know, the competition for creative employment is extremely, um, you know, extremely high in a lot of the bigger cities, the fact that actually there, there's room for growth and experimentation and for, new, for newness um, in Milton Keynes uh, is, is one of the positives, um, I think. 
Great, thank you, Tara. And Lee, if we can bring it out, because obviously your work is as much kind of, you know, it's very big picture. So can you tell us about some of your experiences in terms of the different needs sort of geographically and around the country and how, you know, you feel about that and also this idea of sort of leveling up for the future? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there's still, Things have got better over the last 10 years in the UK in terms of opportunities, but the distribution of creative employment is still very much heavily weighted in the south, southeast in London. Um, and that is problematic if you are an aspiring artist um, in the northeast, for example, because you simply don't have access to the same volume of opportunities that are out there. Um, I do agree with what Tara is saying in that, and I think quite a lot of local governments and combined authorities are starting to wake up to the potential of how the creative and cultural sectors can power growth um, and align with that government agenda that we hear about every day around levelling up. Um, and there's lots of evidence to say that that can definitely be the case. We've seen it, we've seen it in pockets in the northeast, particularly around the creative and digital sectors. We've seen it in the southwest um, around um, creative technology sectors as well um, and it's just trying to build the infrastructure so that people entering into those industries regardless of where they are in the country have access to the same sorts of opportunities but I think it's fair to say that we're not quite there yet where it comes to the UK specifically and there's work to do. And Amani, how does this um, resonate with your kind of experiences and your you know your journey and some of the barriers that you face particularly in visual art um, and how you know you landed um, your job ultimately. I do think that there was a disparity within the UK but I think I've been fortunate enough where I've been doing my undergraduate and my master's both in London so I had access to opportunities down south because I did have a base and I do think that they are more frequent and that is unfortunate that because the socioeconomic barrier is not you know, evenly distributed, it meant that I had certain opportunities that people who didn't have access to go down south didn't have. And ultimately that is extremely unfair, but also as I was reaching the end of my master's, I found that I was also getting pushed out, like job opportunities were harder to come by and it was difficult to even get you know appointed for an interview and I know although there is such a large inequity within the north and the south there are starting to be more kind of opportunities I found anyway in the north or further from London because I feel like the visual arts is really trying hard to make sure it's not seen as so London centric so and because fortunately I am from Manchester the base to Liverpool was an easy access point and as soon as I saw the vacancy I thought I, I want to apply and try and get into like the northern stratosphere of visual arts. So I think I am fortunate that I've had bases in both si si like constituencies almost, but I think ultimately the north is kind of the future in a way of where things are being, you know, plotted back in, even Channel 4 News, that's kind of the head office is moving up north. So I think we are seeing a bit more of kind of a northern base for the creative industries. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to value systems, because I think, um, you know, as Miranda left it, that was the sort of key, you know, one of the key issues that keeps coming up, that everything is pretty much judged by its economic value. And actually, um, what what we sort of need in the future is something that has a different value system. So whether that's community, social, you know, how, how do we really understand this and how do we put it in terms that are going to make a difference, if you like, or an effect uh, in some way? So, Tara, how do you like understand value systems in the work that you do and, you know, for the for the future um, with young people? Um, so, I mean, so, yeah, so Offset Projects, um, you know, operates with a set of really strong core values at its heart. Um, so, you know, things around, notions around, um, actually, you know, very much around, uh, you know, Miranda's definition of care around um, uh, things such as, you know, collaboration, listening, trust, um, inclusion, resilience, you know, all of that kind of sits right at the heart of what Offset Projects does and how it works. Um, and it was really interesting to see the word love 
um, in Miranda's um, uh, definition as well. Um, so I think one of the things I think is really important to bring up when we're talking around kind of values is then is sort of starting to think around things that are joyful as well. Um, so it was quite interesting, actually, a conversation that we were having with uh, one of the young people um, in our groups uh, just a few weeks ago, who was talking about, you know, the fact that actually these kinds of opportunities to create significant change um, and to make things happen are really, really vital. Um, and, she, you know, she was talking about her passion for um, all of the things that she does want to see change. Um, but she came back down to the fact that actually, you know, those moments for joy and to be young are still really, really important in amongst this. So, you know, we're constantly thinking now around how we kind of continue to create these environments that, um, that allow, you know, the kind of the, the pathway creation um, and the exploration um, um, and the kind of the, the change making that young people are telling us that they want to, to see, but that's also done in a really joyful way. Um, and that kind of stays true to, you know, to those notions around love um, and around inclusion. And then also having conversations, you know, talking about that quite openly um, as a means of changing um, perceptions around the fact that actually these words are really important, you know, and um, when we're talking about kind of balancing the needs around kind of, you know, finances and economy, we, it, you know, it's, for us, it's really important not to lose sight of those, you know, those, that, that really, those, those really important words, those, that, that really important language. Um, and show that actually, you know, you can make, essentially you can make money whilst being loving and kind and caring um, and collaborative. Absolutely. And um, Lee, how do you get this across with Creative UK? So I think because you're often, um, you know, involved in policy making and, um, you know, really trying to make the case for creative industries, which often is, you know, unfortunately couched in economic terms for its audience that you're trying to um, speak to. So how, how can you incorporate some of these other value systems into Creative UK's mission? Yeah, so I mean, we often do kind of speak about gross value added and uh, lots of things around the creative industries in economic terms, particularly when we're advocating to government and people who hold certain purse strings, um, et cetera. But, we also are very, very passionate about the workforce and the creative workforce. And if, if anything came through over the last two years in the pandemic, it's just how precarious freelance working is in the creative and cultural sectors. Um, obviously, financially, and you know, we, we advocated and, and lobbied for the self-employed um, income support scheme, which obviously came through but wasn't without its issues. Um, but what el what the other thing that it shone a light on was our freelance communities and our freelance networks started being much more vocal about all the other issues that are related to working within the art sector and within the creative and cultural industries, things like toxic work environments, things like ridiculously over, over long working days and bad working environments and all the things that um, Miranda touched on as well. Um, so we are actually working on designing a new freelance framework that we want the whole of the industry to, 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 to commit to. Um, and to really, and, and that's around building those values into how we work with our freelance communities and just wider general creative workforce as well. So we're just picking up on some research. We found money um, funding from um, all, of, all of the 10 combined authorities, the Metro mayors across the UK, start pulling together some of that insight into some recommendations that we're going to put to government and put to industry as well. Because although we talk about freelancers, it's freelancers who get contracted by businesses, creative businesses and other businesses as well. Um, so it's, it's definitely an ongoing project and something that um, still needs a lot of attention to get to where we want to get to. Yeah, and we've got a really good um, contribution in the journal um, by Dr. Nicholas Sim, who talks specifically about the hustle and um, some of the you know, issues and um, analysis around that at the moment for Generation Z. Um, Amani, back to you. Something that both Skinder and Miranda talked about is how we need new visions, how we need to you know, think afresh in a way and um, you know, for the for the future, you know, even a little bit speculatively, um, you know, what do you think we could do? What are you know? Do you have any new visions um, that you'd really want to see happen? 
couldn't unmute myself then. Um, I do think what Miranda touched upon, care, is going to be so big for our generation because even for the next edition of the Liverpool Biennial, our guest curator, Kani Sile Mabonga, her practice, her curatorial practice is on cure and care. And I think that resonates with so many institutions, practitioners, everybody who works in the field. And I think that's something that we as a generation can take forward and also use as an embodied way of thinking because so much is against us, I think, our age, the cost of living crisis, not having access to the arts. But if you have both cure and care and you embody those two ways of thinking into your learning, then you'll be able to overcome, I think, every like not necessarily everything, but you'll be able to have that practice that allows you to think forward, be slightly more progressive and have empathy and understanding as to how you get to a certain position and how you can have that vision to progress. Um, and I think it's really important as well for institutions and partner venues to also think about how they can work in an environment that also has cure and care. How do you, as Lee was talking about, respond to freelancers who definitely don't have cure and care because they don't have an institution that has that place to back, back them up or situate them. So I think it's important for everyone, particularly us as young people, to have these two practices that are synergized with each other, but also can be used as a way of learning. Completely, yeah, thank you. And also I was talking to a Middlesbrough um, council yesterday and we discussed how, um, you know, freelancers could take advantage of things like, um, you know, paid internships, for example, because they often are hosted by organizations. And of course the whole um, apprenticeship um, degree scheme that's set up and, um, you know, I'm a part of as I co-lead um, an MA in curating, um, but actually it's not open to freelancers. <laughs> so there's a real, this is not my fault, by the way, I would love to, this is the government rules and schemes. So how we sort of, you know, um, you know, we need to address some of that. And I think some of the work you're doing there, Lee, hopefully will make that point um, and come across. Now we're already a little bit running out of time. I know we could carry on for much, much longer, but I just want to ask everybody on the panel, what's the one thing that you think is going to make a difference for everyone for the future of creative work? Um, and if there's anything specific to sort of visual arts engagement and participation, but what's the one thing that's going to make a difference? Um, and Amani. Patience. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure if you want me to elaborate, but I'm going to leave it as a one word answer. <laughs> Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. And Lee? Um, we haven't really touched on this and I'll try to be as su succinct as possible, um, but I'd like to see some major changes to our curriculum um, and how young people are engaging with arts at school, um, particularly, particularly public schools, because there's a massive discrepancy there, especially when you look at public schools versus private schools as well and how much is invested in arts awareness and participation. And I think that just sets the context for everything that falls after it um, and also all the issues that we're facing with equity, with access into the industry as well. So I think that needs um, some serious care and attention. Thank you. Yes. And that's covered quite a bit as well in the journal for sure. And Tara. Um, so I just very quickly want to echo Lee's uh, statement just then, you know, this is the, the one thing that our young people constantly uh, uh, keep telling us, you know, the barriers created by systems and gatekeepers of those systems. So I really want to echo that. Um, that's such a big question, Sarah. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, the thing that springs uh, to my mind immediately um, comes from the list of top tips that uh, are listed or are given by the young people who contributed to the journal article um, from Offset Projects. Um, but one of the things that they say is, you know, they talk about giving them trust. Um, and the more that we can trust in, uh, you know, young communities, ideas um, and their skills and their talents, um, you know, the, the more exciting and interesting and creative and different things um, that I think can, that that can happen. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you all. Um, I just want to invite um, Jane Sillis um, to join us, who is the director of Engage. And she's just got some, you know, parting thoughts on this for us. Hi, Jane. Hi, hello. So I'm, I'm, I'm Jane Sillis. I'm director of Engage. I'm a white woman in her 60s and I've got, I'm sitting in a very white room. Um, so I'm just going to say a few thank yous um, to all of you folk uh, for taking part this evening, but particularly to the panel and, get, and give a couple of notices. So thank you so much, Sarah, for doing such a brilliant job at both editing the journal and sharing this evening and really um, deftly taking us through some really complex issues. Thank you to our keynote, um, Miranda, but also to all of you brilliant panelists. I was just so impressed that you managed to cover practice, research and policy, and that you, you looked at some of the kind of really knotty issues, some of the barriers, um, the precarity that we that we face within the industry, but you also talked about courage and joy. And of course, Skinder talked about courage too, which I thought was wonderful, a really sort of wonderful beginning to this evening. Um, we're going to be um, looking more at all of these issues at an event tomorrow morning, which I really commend to you. If you remember, uh, some of you have already signed up. Uh, it's from 11 12, till 12.30. And it's from two wonderful members of the General Editorial Advisory Board, who both work at University College London, Annie Davy and Claire Robbins. So please do join us for that if you can. So a few more thank yous. Um, a big thank you to all of our contributors. But I also want to thank um, my colleague, Lily Mason, who's worked tirelessly on both the journal and on this evening's event. And then two other colleagues, uh, uh, Jessica Aikerman, who helped with proofing, and Clem uh, Damoulin, who helped with the, the graphics. Um, so please do watch out for the podcast that Sarah mentioned right at the beginning. This is a great new innovation for us, and we're really hoping to animate some of the content, but really keep the dialogue going through all of that. And being a good education organization, we'll be sending out an evaluation form to you lovely folks so we can find out what, you've, what you enjoyed about this evening and how we can change and nuance what we're about. So um, I just really want to say a massive thank you to everyone. Um, as Sarah said, there are lots of different ways to access the journal, become a member. Of course, I'd really say that, but you can subscribe and you can um, just have this, this journal as well. So take care and enjoy the rest of this evening. Thank you, Jane. And just another big thank you to all of the panellists. And yeah, I hope you um, follow us and join the podcast where um, I promise we'll have lots of um, different voices, lots of young people and lots more to think about. So thank you. This event has been about the launch of Engage Journal 46, Generation Z and the future of creative work. Thank you. Thank you.